Hello, and welcome to the show. It's just me today. Well, at least for the first 10 minutes, Steve's on his way. I'm Mike Foster. Welcome to C9K, better known as Cluster, you know. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the Grafana CVE. There was a big whoosh breach, as well as some other crazy news, including some FTX and crypto. Have to always talk about that. And we have a special guest. Alex Ellis is going to be joining the show, talking about Kubernetes, open function as a service, and all of the cr uh, really interesting projects that he's working on. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello on this beautiful Friday. At least it's beautiful by me. This is C9K. So it's your cloud native, I say vlog. We say podcast, but I feel like it's more of a vlog. Yeah, your cloud native vlog where we talk about uh, the general news in the container space, a little bit of security mixed in with some craziness, some CVE drama, and of course, some big spenders. The big spenders for today, I think, are more people who got hit with GDPR fines than actual investments. But I digress, they're still spending money in crazy ways. So we'll get to that. And of course, we have Alex Ellis joining. We're super excited to have him. We're joining about half past. So we have some general news to get into and all the craziness. First, of course, uh, if you got a notification, that's great. If not, hit that little subscribe button, the like button, so that uh, you know when we go live because we're not, well, we've been pretty good with coming live over the last couple of weeks, but we're not always the best. And just as a heads up, we plan on taking let's say Christmas and the holidays off, we're going to come back with version 3.0. So new updates, new visuals, although we'll keep some of the things that at least I like, like the big spender promo and all that stuff. And we do have a little special guest intro that Steve and I like to use. Uh, speaking of which, yeah, Steve's not here. He's late on the train. He's supposed to come in the next five minutes. So I'll be doing the general news and walking us through the Let's say the intro stuff first, and then he'll pop in and we get to roast him. So if you're watching, when he shows up late, I need you to make fun of him in the chat for me. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right, without further ado, let's get into the news. Now, this is going to be awkward because I have to share my screen. I'm not used to doing this. This is crazy. Uh, but let's see if I can uh, do this more efficiently. Normally, Steve's really good at this. This is why I, I rely on him. And look at that. It's because I have this wide screen and I need to zoom in on all this stuff. So this one came across my desk. It is a PwC article talking about the, let's say, zero trust in Kubernetes. So why Kubernetes security challenges call for zero trust strategy. I found it interesting. We were talking about zero trust last week. And then this is kind of an SEO article. 
<laughs> if I'm being honest. When you started to go through it, we talk about zero trust as the trending security paradigm. We talked last week about how we hate the term zero trust, but in terms of Kubernetes, they don't really match. Kubernetes by default is wide open from the network to the RBAC controls to the default service accounts, which is why when you get started, it's so easy. It's nice and easy to set up something. If you use something like Rancher, you have Nginx already installed, so you have an ingress, things like that. But it is, uh, let's say, not hardened by default, not secure by default. Uh, that is, I think, why PwC is trying to get in the space. One, literally in the third or fourth paragraph, they talk about the security challenges and the market for Kubernetes. So I found it very interesting that a consulting company is starting to, let's say, get into Kubernetes. A lot of it's going to be consulting and API security, RBAC controls, how to actually implement this at scale. They're going to have consulting teams come in to talk about this. But I think... One of the other reasons why I put this is if PwC and a lot of the consulting companies are starting to talk about this, I think it's a sign of, let's say, more adoption in Kubernetes. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments. I see a couple people following along. Um, the other part I wanted to get to, so the next one is, and this is so much better when I have somebody to tell me when I'm wrong. It's very weird being online just by yourself and also with this huge screen it's just my face normally i like it when it's a little bit smaller uh the next one is the vault Ooh, if i get rid of this is the vault sidecar so i'm kind of curious if anybody who's watching right now has experimented with vault has used it because it is open source obviously um, but injecting secrets is a let's say it's a challenging subject because who manages it if you have developers how are you uh, making sure that the secrets are injected why uh, let, let's say what's the reasoning for why they have to be like that is kubernetes secrets enough how does it get managed it's always a challenging subject which is why i thought it was kind of an interesting topic that i was hoping steve could weigh out on especially if being from apollo or uh well i should say no uh, prisma cloud palo alto bridge crew um i was hoping that he would weigh in because i know that uh, they have a integration with vault here um but unfortunately he's not here so Again, we got to roast him in the chat. So for the agent sidecar injector, I recently had a conversation with uh, some Vault reps talking about how it's being used. So, and Vault obviously is a uh, it's a key management store, not just for Kubernetes, but you know what's the the process for injecting the secret, and then how are you verifying that it's there? It was more an organizational challenge, right? Like, so you have your developers; they're working in their containers. Maybe they have. The different applications that are running do they talk to a security team who manages vault is there a single team i have uh i remember in previous experiences uh, with companies we were tasked with implementing vault and setting up all the configuration files for it um, so that they could run it themselves but again like they wanted this automated so that developers would automatically get their keys and their specific credentials injected um but yeah, so that's, uh, I was just more curious to see if anybody had been using it and uh, using it uh, in production too. Apparently, I don't think it's their big money maker. I want to say Terraform is, is doing very, very well for them. Uh, but I am curious to, to see that because especially from a security standpoint with things like ACS or Prisma Cloud, you want to be able to verify that in the UI, right? Like if you have some sort of automation that's using a vault you want to be able to see, okay, well, the secret was injected at runtime. It's in memory. The container's not there anymore. Um, and we should be able to deprioritize those specific containers if they have a secret that's used like that, or maybe at least lower their risk. I think that that's a, a pretty important feature. Um, whether you're doing it using Vault or something else, I think flagging that and calling it out is extremely useful. The next thing. So... Uh, this is actually a crazy article. It's a third of companies don't know if they were hacked in the last year. A third, which I think is crazy. I mean, it, I'm not shocked by this, but a third of organizations don't know if they were hacked in the last year. Um, Steve, I, I think, is going to come on and probably riff into this, but... When we talk about security, observability is security. And you look at all of these disparate cloud environments where people are in Amazon, they're in Azure, they're using Google Analytics tools or something like that. And a lot of security teams don't even know what their developers and the various teams are doing. 
they just need buy-in. You get into these companies where they say, hey, we want to use this tool, but then they've purchased two different tools and they have it um, you know, spread out. And the, let's say, upper management, the leadership doesn't want to shake things up and piss off some of the security people because they're so used to using their Aqua or Prisma or Apollo, whatever it is. Uh, speaking of which, the the guy who's late just popped into the, the background. I'm waiting. He's looking like, like a deer in headlights. Like, do I bring him in? Do I not bring him in? He's shaking his head like not yet. But so Steve, for context, we're talking about a third of companies don't know if they've been hacked. And we, what is the state of global security? And I think with all the layoffs that we were talking about last week, you probably think that this is going to get worse in the next year. Um, but yes, increased vigilance and budgets. Hey, there he is. Welcome, welcome. I, I added myself. Yeah. <laughs> you can't keep me out. Apologies, everyone. I am uh, late. But I agree with this article. <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about how observability is security. Yeah, totally. Uh, and this, uh, what, what, who, who thinks it isn't security? Or do, like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. <laughs> and that's, I, I think it's just, it shows how, let's say, little integrated security tools are into some of these environments. Sometimes they just let developers run rampant. Uh, and you don't even need a security tool. I mean, simple things like, um, what's, what's uh, the security tool that is uh, API in the cloud environments? I'm forgetting Wiz or something like that. That goes oh, salt, and looks at salt, salt is API. Salt API, but like Wiz goes and looks at all your cloud environments through the oh. cloud APIs and gathers yeah. all of uh, the different machines and, and what you're working on, your resources. It's like that. There's a tremendous value in just looking and seeing what you're actually spending money on and where everything is. Right? Hell yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Oh, and look at that. We're swapped too. We swapped that back. Hey, yeah. okay. Now we're back to normal. Fish out of water there for a second. <laughs> It's like, you're Steve? What's going on? There we go. All right. So where, what have I missed other than I, I know the list? Yes. We talked a little bit about Vault. We talked about 30% of cybersecurity or 30% of companies not knowing what's going on in their environments. And right. what was the, the first one? Oh, yeah. Why Kubernetes needs a zero trust. I thought that was very interesting that PwC, one of the biggest consulting companies in the world, is talking about zero trust for Kubernetes. It's like SEO article? Marketing? Pretty much both. We need, yeah, we need some kind of a, a klaxon. Mm -hmm. If we think an article is just SEO. Yeah. And so the the last one, I think, before we get into the craziness WTF, Steve, I'm not sure if you want to take over as producer, but is the it's a Reddit article. It says the best way to install Kubernetes for learning, which I thought was a good segue because we have Alex Ellis coming on and you know making tools like Arcade, which makes things super easy to get up and started with Kubernetes. I thought he would definitely have an opinion on that. So shall I share then? Do you want me to do that? Or do you want to? Yeah, to go ahead. I, I like it better when you're, you're producing in the background. All I right. get to just relax. <laughs> you like it better when I do the work. <laughs> yeah. Give me a good manager. The there best way to install Kubernetes and use Kubernetes for learning. Is there some way? What? I want to, I want to install in the, the context. I want to install my own Kubernetes cluster, but I'm not sure the best way to do it. Ubuntu, embedded. Some way to containerize it. This guy hasn't done any Googling. Yep. K3s. Yeah, I mean, I think K3s is nice. I definitely would recommend putting it in a virtual machine if you're on a local host and running K3s because mm -hmm. I think interacting with the host is very important. A lot of people will like just spin up a container or they'll just run Docker for their use cases. I think you need to interact with the components. Um, the easiest way for learners, yeah, probably the cheapest way too is a virtual machine locally. With K3s running on it, if you do I, have a little bit of money to spend, like a simple virtual machine in the cloud is not too expensive, especially if you shut it off and you remember to. <laughs> what about you? What are your thoughts? Depends what you're learning it for, because the one the one I do a lot of my, my are playing on, I, I I have it sitting in a Google VM, right? I, I could have done it on anything, could have done my laptop, but I actually did it old school, uh, Kube ADM, like it's a and it, it is that way because that's what the exam makes you do. Yep. So I've got all the bits and bobs done via that. And so that was, and that was pretty easy. Like it wasn't ridiculous. K3, K3s is great if you just want to like throw pods into it and mm -hmm. get used to kubectl. You know, that's more your developer one. There's another one. There's like not K3s, but it's like there's another. 
Coop mini spray? version of no coop spray, not that one. There's another bird. Uh, there's like a competitor to K threes. Okay, that my colleague Matt is like swears by now. He says it's so much more stable. Nice. But I don't know. Maybe it's here. Not mm -hmm. here. I, and I think it's important to know like what are you using K eights for if you want to learn Kubernetes? Is it just managing containers? Are you not going to be interacting or you know making sure that the nodes are up or you're not going to be upgrading the nodes and all that stuff? Then yeah, I think K3s is fine. If you're doing any sort of CKA exam, you have to use K8s and you have to get into the host and actually be able to diagnose issues. You have to know what right. the configuration files are. You need to know Linux. Um, yeah, it takes yeah. a little bit more if you're going to be an operator or operations team. So I think that was one of the things that was missing in that call out, that specific Reddit post is, hey, I'm learning us for this role or for this job. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I think that that distinction is very important. Context. Context is key. Come on, yes. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, craziness. We're getting into the crazy stuff. But... Uh, too funny. All right. <laughs> By the way, Steve, you never, uh, you were at a meetup, right? You missed the general news section, so you didn't get to brief the people on what you've been up to. That's yeah, kind of du du double meetups. I ran I ran the DevSecOps on the gathering uh, the, 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 the Wednesday, and then there was OWASP on Thursday, which is very convenient. I don't know if that was done intentionally, but for people who don't live in London direct, having them back to back was very handy. So that was pretty good. That's kind of my thing. Next week, I'm off to reinvent so woo. Reinvent. either no show or i do it live from there uh, yeah up to you i mean it is is it thanksgiving week next week i'm not in america the americans know. um but yeah Just, i feel like a lot yeah. of people are going to be uh very relaxed so i don't we'll we'll figure it out make sure you hit the little subscribe and notification bell to know when we're going live you'll see or you won't but otherwise it'll be same time next week um, I'm worried well, that Steve's going to have a massive hangover because he's been going to be in Vegas for a week. So. Never. Never? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. You, ha you First put article. this one up. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, the police doing weird things again. Welcome to England. <laughs> our, our, we're really good at police. Suffolk Police published victims information and mass data breach. So this it's even better than what it sounds like there. They are sexual assault victims. They just put them all up on the website. Uh, there's, there's, and that's kind of it. Like you can read it and go, okay, so that's fantastic. Some survivors of sexual violence have reported to the police they are entitled to lifetime anonymity. Well, yeah, yep. Or you're on the front of a website and the police did it. Yep. And he's, uh, look at, he's not happy. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's all. It's just so stupid. How does it happen? They don't really get into that because it's Barry Mercury. Whatever yeah. paper this is, um, <laughs> doesn't, they don't know how, but it's mm -hmm. just that that's first class stupid. This just uh, also lends more credence to my theory that I don't care necessarily if certain groups or the government follows me, but it's also what's going to happen in 20 years when they don't know how to manage the data, right? Or your phone gets tapped and that information gets stored 15 years. What happens when they get hacked? And Maybe they're nice, but the people with the other information or that hack you, yeah, they're not so nice. They're not so nice. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's taking time, Bob. All right. Speaking of Next. hacking, speaking of real hacking, oh, you like using this other format, Bing? Yes, it's kind of an interesting setup. All those fans, especially when they're if you're an Ethereum mining, you wouldn't have cool fans like that. Come on, I mean. You pretty much broke now. Ethereum. <laughs> anyway, Ethereum it's, yeah. went, uh, went uh, proof of stake recently, so it doesn't do proof of work anymore. So, yep, it's uh, it was a good change for them. It's going to take four years, I think, for the whole transition to happen. But yeah. Um, anyways, this was it's a good article talking about how the government admitted that the log for shell vulnerability was used by Iranian back hackers. This was earlier this year into an unpatched VMware Horizon server. Hmm. Unpatched. And I, this is also, whenever I get on calls, I say if your updates are less than 90 days and you have zero critical or important, like high or important vulnerabilities, it's a pretty healthy environment. And this yeah. was at the beginning of the year, which is past 90 days. It was unpatched, so unfixed. And it pretty much is correct, right? Like there's 
a specific amount of time which you have to do this obviously these hackers were going and looking for this vulnerability because it was very wide uh, well known um, mm -hmm. but i think it was funny it was oh yeah there's dan lorink talking about log for shell it has everywhere yeah log for shell is endemic it's going to be around forever yeah ceo and co-founder of chain guard he's got um, a good pr company he's no kidding good... yep yeah cool uh, actually this, this is i saw this and my no my brain just went this is great because we talk about log for shell but i'd never seen an actual proven attack that used mm -hmm. it so you know in a completely selfish standpoint this article is going to get screen captured and go into a few presentations <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice uh, that's a good point got to do that the <laughs> next one is yep. ftx the the crypto stuff we got to talk about it we have to yeah i have a couple of references to crypto in this one unauthorized transactions drain millions from the exchange you give your hot take i'm going to go down to the related oh. article here which is my favorite bit of this which is really small what, what is that? <laughs> 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 yeah for context the the background of ftx if people have been watching the founders basically all live together i think in the bahamas they originally were in us moved to hong kong and then recently moved to the bahamas where and i think they're all under 30 like very or like 30 ish very new to money I, the ceo at one point or the co-founder was ranked the 24th wealthiest person in the world last year or this year um, and it's all gone to crap it's all gone away for in terms of the hack i think it's too convenient i think that yeah. whoever hacked this had been sitting on the ability to do this for a long time or they've known about this flaw whatever the situation was and that as soon as the government got involved and was going to go pull money they're like nope let's just hide and squirrel this away because i think it also buys leverage for the people who work because people are going to want their money back there's yeah. no way that the founder is going to be able to come up he's he's indebted like a couple hundred million so now he has leverage if he knows where this money's going or how to let's say get it back but um yeah my other hot take is make sure you trust companies that you invest in and there's a specific reason if I can toot my own horn, why IBM's doing well in the stock market where certain other speculate, speculative investments are not, right? Things that have been around for years where you trust the management, where the balance sheet's good, where they are regulated and the government is coming after people who do bad things. There's a reason why people invest money in them, right? Yep. That's my I, take. No, well, I mean, particularly in the crypto world, like how many, how many, how many crypto anythings have just kind of, vanished off the earth or been hacked or everything was gone like they're just crypto is one of those worlds where geeks know how it works and so they suddenly they go oh i'm going to be an online wallet or i'm going to be binance or i'm going to be and it's like we how how many security things do we encounter in experienced teams that have been around a long time can get hacked and then these guys just knock this thing up mm -hmm. um it's super dodgy like I have, I have some crypto, but I use Coinbase and Coinbase has like a military grade, um, security team. So it's like, I sort of trust it, mm -hmm. but I also realize it's crypto. So, you know, it's all going to go to zero and burn down eventually anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. That's my, that's my hot. Take. It's all going to go to zero. All of it. It's all, it's all going to zero, man. There's no, <laughs> there's no hope or I'm going to be a billionaire. There's only two, two options. Well, good luck. I wish Thanks. you. Uh... Thanks. I need it. <laughs> yeah. And okay. The uh, the last one in the WTF section, I believe, is the Infosys. Or we had another one yep. with Woosh. With Woosh uh, too. Infosys is first. Okay. Infosys. Infosys leaked full admin access AWO keys on PyPy for over a year. It's great. You can check out their website for a lot of buzzwords, but it's <laughs> for over a year. <laughs> yeah. That seems remarkable, right? Mm -hmm. That because there's so many ways to find AWS keys, you've accidentally stuck in something. It seems it seems kind of bonkers. Strange pull request in my PyPy project. This is where I'm I'm late because I didn't get to uh, read my article. I was going to say this I is your it. article. I know it's mine. I know it's my. I stuck it in here because I thought it was funny, but. Uh, 
I didn't get to review before I got here. Alex doesn't know this. I got here late. He's he's yeah. he's in the green room right now. Yes, listening to our ads. But I mean, I think over a year is is just it's kind of ridiculous. But with S three buckets and the way that uh, access is divvied out in Amazon, I'm not shocked. I'm sure that there is a ton of different situations like this. What is the penalty for leaving the credentials? Is this a GDPR issue? <laughs> Well, what, are the, what does that have access to? That's essentially well, yeah, and it, but typically you have to disclose that if you the keys, if you're available to be hacked, right? If you're there's the ability right. to be hacked, you have to disclose this. So I'm kind of curious right. what's going to come out from Infosys. I don't know. Stay tuned. Yeah, no kidding. The uh, the last one in the WTF, Woosh. Woosh got hacked. I'll just look straight over to it. Yeah. Oh. We value your privacy. There you go. Yes, uh, the Russian it, the Russian scooter sharing service. I feel like everybody has this like ride scooter sharing service except for Canada. It's not in Toronto. Um, maybe it's because we need winter tires on these things to get around. But people would die. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so Woosh is Russia's leading mobility service platform. Forty cities, seventy five thousand scooters. Um, I don't think it's going to impact any of our viewers. I'll say that. But it came across no. my <laughs> came across my desk as a hack. I wonder if it claims that IT experts had managed to thwart it successfully. I just think it's very interesting. It's Russia. They're always going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Oh uh, well, the leak did not affect sensitive user, user data. Yeah, we care. That's uh, it's very important. Um, I'm kind of shocked that this article was even written in the first place. It's like no, they're saying it, we got hacked. Don't worry, nothing happened. Really? Right. Doesn't it's like it's a Russian anything. service that got hacked, and it's an American media. It's a very interesting hmm. article, which is why it's in the WTF section. What? Right. Exactly. Should we All get right. on to uh, the big spenders? We got to get Alex Ellison here. I can't have him sit in the green room forever. Yeah, we got three minutes to kill all this stuff off. Let's go. All right. Discord is the latest in the wall of shame for <laughs> GDPR fines. 800,000 euros. I wonder what percentage that was. You know how it was always supposed to be like 4% or... Yeah, which is why I, I was kind of going to ask that question. That's a good point you brought up. Like Google gets fined 30 million or a specific a big number and then Discord gets fined 800,000. You're like, this well, is very telling in terms of how much they make. Right. Yeah, I mean it's usually it's tied directly to your uh yeah your gross, I think. It's it's uh it's mm. pretty pretty damaging for a year, right? So it's still a lot of money though, isn't it? Yes, Discord is but a voice over IP technology. I've never heard it be talked like that. Uh, typically what? Heard it be, yeah, that's that's how it's described, the context. Discord is a voice over IP technology that allows users to chat via their microphone or webcam over the internet, which I and guess yeah. And an instant messaging service. Oh, that <laughs> yeah. bit. The yeah. bit that everyone actually uses it for. Yeah. I mean, it does have pretty awesome, you know, other features, but I didn't think that's what it's known for. Hmm. Yeah. So failure to define and respect a data retention period appropriate to the purpose. So during the investigation, the company stated it did not have a written data retention policy. That's what I uh, got fined for. This, this is, is a pretty good article because, I mean, in terms of seeing the reasons it failed to comply with GDPR is actually pretty fascinating. What's interesting is who on earth went in and assessed them like and found it all mm -hmm. or who rumbled them. I don't, I don't understand that because you know what I mean? Yeah. Failure to comply with obligation to provide the information, failure to ensure data protection by default. It's a yeah. very interesting article. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really, and it's in uh, French. Oh, look at that. <laughs> there you go. All right, the other, well, the actual big spender, I think, for the week. How? You want to you wanna launch into this one? Uh, I never heard of these guys. Palo Alto? <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're buying, so I knew about this for ages. It was, it, and it got leaked, of course, because all everyone in cybersecurity in Tel Aviv goes to the same sandwich shop. So 
everybody knows everything uh, a while back. And yeah, cider security, cider for up to 300 million, which is broken into two pieces. There you go, 195 million. And I like when they say cash. I just imagine a briefcase, you know, with clicks yeah. open and someone showing you this is the money. Well, you're getting a good tax break this year, that's for sure. Two hundred million and a hundred million in shares. Um, what's kind of funny, the the way this is, the deal has been rumored for weeks, um, <laughs> and they're uh, and there's a, there's a bit in here where they're saying what Palo Alto will probably say that it was only two hundred million. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're publishing it. This is TechCrunch. Whatever whatever it says, it doesn't matter what you what we say as Palo Alto. But anyway, Cider's in, Cider Security is an interesting uh, purchase because. Like being part of the bridge crew acquisition, there's an overlap in what they do and what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but I imagine if it's anything like what happened with bridge crew, uh, I'll never meet a single person from cider security for like the next 18 months because they won't kind of like, I never met anybody at Palo Alto for my first year. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where and how they fit and what it is, what on earth it is we're going to do with them now. But congrats to congrats to cider. I know, uh, I know Palo Alto was seriously shopping around for somebody in that space uh, for quite some time. Yeah, we're going to need a, a couple demos in the new year. They have to, if I ask. They have to now. Yeah, right? Cool. Uh, big CV, Grafana CV. Do Ready? it. Yep. Now what starts with the letter C? Yes, the cookie monster has cometh. <laughs> At stream. Oh, it's so small. Sorry. I'll make this bigger. No worries. Yes. Unauthorized access to arbitrary endpoints in the Grafana code base. It is a 9.8 CV CVSS score. Yep. That's Did you get a chance to uh, to look at it, Steve? Nope. I was going to let you do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I yeah it's, it's a raised condition in the HTTP context oh, okay. uh, creation. So. It's uh, and I believe that there's already a patch out. Yes, a fix is already out to get it. It's essential to update the vulnerable versions from 9.2x to 9.2.4.4. Yeah. 9.2.4. There you go. Um, That's so cool. like most things, just update, just a quick update will be okay. Um, especially for Grafana, it's not uh, be, being a UI that should be a pretty easy update. What happens? What goes wrong? If, if, if what does the exploit do? Oh, I did not get to that point. I don't think that there has been a. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't see a, a way to actually exploit it. Yeah, that's what's well, a nine point eight. I mean, that generally yeah, means it's... you can exploit it. Well, I'll look into it and then we'll see. I think it was a to bypass authorization on arbitrary service endpoints. Okay, well, maybe there, if there's a way to do it, then I'll tinker and I'll see if I can see if I can do it. Yeah, probably not next week as you're going to no. be at reInvent. Uh, but we, I'm going to be looking forward to a breakdown of reInvent after either yeah, next Friday or the Friday after. Yes, sir. Okay. Anything for you, sir. <laughs> okay. I need you on it. All right. Now we don't often get to use this, uh, this little intro, but we do have a special guest that we want to bring in. So for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. Recognized and known the world over as the people's champion of the world, Alex Ellis. Alex Ellis. <laughs> Alex. People's champion of serverless. There you go. Yep. There you go. There we go. I'll serverless do, uh... and uh, Kubernetes tooling with Arcade, yes. right? Yeah, very... absolutely. We, uh, we well, before uh, Steve was late and he came on, we were talking about some of the easier ways to get started in Kubernetes. And... Uh, I was going through Arcade earlier this week. Very, very cool tool. Um, Want to just give me a breakdown of one, how it started, what you were kind of going through. Actually, hold on. First, give us a, the users and uh, followers a little breakdown of what you do and um, everything that you're into, and then get into Arcade. Yeah, actually, um, I'm not going to talk about Arcade today. We're going to talk about Actuated, which is all about Firecracker and VMs. So, um, how can you run a container a, and a, perhaps even a build securely inside a Kubernetes cluster? What would you do? What would you two do? 
Steve, you want to take this one first? No, go, go. He, he's going to build right a container. To build a container in Kubernetes. Mm. Um, for me, I'd probably get a, a base image. have to scan it and make sure that it's ingested properly. That's going to be your runner or your, whatever you're using to help build it, the service. Um, then you need to do some sort of scan on your application with like Sneak or something to see what the dependencies are. Maybe ship that as a binary or something like that into your universal base image. Uh, all those have to be signed and authenticated for whoever is doing the developing, if, if it's internal or external. Um, and then that needs to be signed after build. And you need to make sure that it's stored in a private registry, something that's controlled and then authenticated at deploy time. Um, it's all awesome. very good stuff. I mean, I, I think those are those are all sort of practices that we've seen in enterprise companies. But when it comes to the actual build of the container, there's a lot of things that need to be done um, that we don't talk about very often. And that'd be things like um, mounting a Docker socket into a build directly from a Kubernetes node, which would let any code executing there do all manner of evil things, um, really bad things, by the way. And there's loads of teams that I've spoken to that are doing that, you know, and shipping software to their customers. They'll be doing all the other stuff you talk, talked about, SNCC and Dependabot, right? But they have this glaring security problem. Um, and if you don't mount the socket, because that's going away with the Docker shim, mm -hmm. people tend to run Docker in Docker, which is quite slow, was yeah. never really meant for production and needs a privileged container which is almost as bad, if not worse, than mounting the Docker socket. And so quite a lot of teams are building their software inside runners, running as pods on Kubernetes using these tools. Mm -hmm. um, Canico, again, still needs to run as root to mount different layers in. And this is what I've been spending probably on and off for like six months looking at. Um, oh. And if you go right back to the beginning of that journey, I spent some time with Richard Case explaining about um, what is the difference between a container, legacy VM, and a micro VM. And so I've got a couple of slides I can show you and a little demo if you're interested. Uh, definitely very interested. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, awesome. Um, do you know how to uh, share the screen? Yeah, you got it. Um, I can see it. I'll bring the it up. The mighty container. Obviously, everybody remembers how Docker in its infancy was all about um, developer meetups, um, free stuff. The Docker Hub was so great, transforming DevOps. Um, Docker today, very recently, I ran into an issue where a build I was running, because I, I couldn't get my software right, and I kept changing it. And every time I queued up a build, it was pulling a Docker image in a build. Mm -hmm. And eventually, it hit the rate limit and it stopped working. And so the Docker of today isn't isn't really the darling of Silicon Valley that it used to be. They're now kind of playing tough. Um, mm -hmm. And this is where it started, though, right? We we said, right, we'll have one host kernel and we'll take our user land and operating system and apps, and that's what we'll package up as our software, go through SNCC and all the other tools that you mentioned there. Um, and it will work on my machine the same as production. This was really fast because you can run, type in Docker run and have what feels like an entire Linux system like mm -hmm. almost instantly. Yeah. Um, when you look at a traditional VM, there's another level of abstraction here, another level of separation. So if we think about how AWS looks at this, you have a guest kernel running on the host kernel. So you've got a, a VM or a micro VM. And in traditional VMs, legacy VMs, let's say VMware, um, perhaps some of some stuff like Proxmox, um, you have a very slow startup for these things. Right? The images are gigantic. They're probably tens of gigabytes. Um, that means there's a lot of surface area, a lot that can go wrong. They're really expensive. The hypervisors, if you want to have a contract with one of the companies that um, sells these platforms. And it's difficult to integrate with them. Or if you want to integrate, you have to buy another product that, again, like doubles or triples your bill. They're not fun, but they have this great property that AWS um, 
saw as, as a potential solution to that problem they had, which is really good isolation. So what Firecracker does is it takes the idea of Docker that we can just package up the operating system and the app. Um, we can have a fast boot, distribute images in a container registry, but then it takes what VMs have done and strips them right back. So what I really like about Firecracker, for instance, is that you can almost drop it in where you would use Docker. So um, it has a pretty much instant start. We'll see in a demo how instant that is. Um, it doesn't emulate things like floppy disk drives and GPUs because they're not needed for a lot of Kubernetes type workloads. Mm -hmm. um, it has a really good API. You can use it with REST, has a Go SDK. Um, and you can actually mix it with all of your container tools. So it works great with ContainerD to push and pull images. Um, it works great with container networking initiative to actually get IP addresses and allocate them to VMs as well. Very cool. You said almost like VM or um, almost like Docker, almost like VMs. What is missing there? Is it just a couple of tools that have been pulled out that aren't needed? So Docker has a model where it uses one kernel. Mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a VM, if you're on your Mac or in production, just on the bare metal server or the VM and everything's shared. So the security boundary is, is there. For some things, it's suitable. Um, for other things, it really isn't suitable. And you talked about a number of CVs at the beginning of this uh, live stream. And there've been a number around containers. Firecrackers even had a couple. Um, it doesn't have any known vulnerabilities at the moment for breakouts, but that's the main thing. So quite often when I speak to people and they ask me about um, technology like Firecracker, they say, will this replace Docker and containers? And for most use cases, it won't, um, but it may replace some of the use cases we had for VMs Interesting. with the user experience of Docker. And where I'm seeing it is, um, there's a company that I was talking to recently called Astronomer. They run um, Apache Airflow for customers, mm -hmm. and they need to run some custom code in their cloud. What they're going to do? Well, they're going to isolate that code in a micro VM because it's much stronger level of isolation than a container is going to provide. Interesting. Stronger yeah. isolation um, just because of the lack of surface area? What's the... That's definitely one of the things. The other one is that you have a completely different VM with its own memory space. Okay. Um, and you, that Firecracker then comes with tools to rate limit it and restrict it further. And because you're looking at it from, let's say, the host where the VMs are running, you can do things like configure the networking, the ingress, set up firewalls, um, and just keep really tight rain on it. Very cool. Uh, so I see this... we have a, a couple of people in the chat that uh, are fans. Written in Rust yeah. as well. It is written in Rust. However, um, the way that 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 I've used it or we've used it at OpenVAS is um, with the Go SDK. Now, okay. if people do want to just try this out, there is a quick start in the Firecracker docs, and you copy and paste the commands in, and you'll be in a in a VM in a very short period of time. But what I want to show you is how to apply this. So um, we've had a quick debrief on Firecracker. This is a blog post that, are, that I've written, and there's a video people can go and watch. But there's a few things wrong with um, hosted action runners, GitHub action runners. The main thing is that they're just constrained. And um, if they are um, run, with seven gigs of RAM and two cores, there's only so much you can push through that. Mm -hmm. I know Stefan Proden in the Flagger project, he was telling me that he was trying to run a kind cluster and a number of times it just wouldn't start up. We couldn't run two at the same time because just not enough RAM there. Um, so can you make them faster? You can add your own. And this is where you start to run into a lot of different problems, um, including a kind of a detour that there's no ARM runners today that are hosted. So there's an open source project called Parker 
um, which is from Polis Signals. They were, well, Fred was running a build and using emulation, something called QMU, mm -hmm. on a hosted runner to make it look like ARM to build an ARM image for customers using ARM. Um, it took him 33 and a half minutes. What I did is I moved that to Firecracker on an ARM64 machine and it took one minute, 26 seconds. Wow. Oh. Instead. Cool. Now, awesome. GitHub may at some point in the future add the ability to go to these, but if you're there now, and you add a self-hosted runner to a public project, um, they really recommend against that. And they talk about all sorts of security issues, being able to take over the repo, um, get right access to the account. It's not good. Um, and so one of the things that we do have actuated is try to help you allocate those builds more efficiently to different hosts. So if your host can run 10 builds at once, um, it will just pack it out, just like Kubernetes does. You are going to have complete isolation because of the VMs that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Whereas traditionally, you're sharing Docker sockets or using Docker in Docker, and you have poor isolation. Side effects can be left over. Somebody could potentially take over the cluster, even inadvertently, by running some malicious code, even if it wasn't um, on purpose. And um, it's a pretty simple system. Once you've installed the app and set up a machine with the agent, you just put the runs on label, um, change it to actuated from what you had. So if you have a look at this uh, GitHub action, it's a very simple one. It just builds whenever there's a commit and it's actually going to go on an ARM machine. Mm -hmm. um, it's installing HD Palm because I want to test the hard disk, but it also just run some nice commands just to kind of probe the machine, see how much RAM it's got and that kind of stuff. So what I would do to trigger that is I'd either do a commit on it or I would just trigger the workflow. What I also want to show you is I've got a Mac mini right behind me, an M1 with Asahi Linux. This is the agent, just ran the agent. I hit commit. I've got a couple of our machines, but I think it will come to this one because it's got a higher priority. And that that's basically it. As soon as you saw that text, the mm -hmm. actions runner was running. Wow. And as we can see, that was probably 0 0.9 seconds to get to that point. And it's literally running the job now. A traditional VM cannot start that quickly yeah. and get you into code. Yeah, no kidding. What's uh, what's one of the biggest issues holding up um, usage of this? I mean, Firecracker looks extremely fast, more secure than a traditional virtual machine. Is it uh, just relatively new? Uh, people not understand the benefits? It's not new. I mean, uh, it's been around for two, three years now. Um, if we hit come over here, we can see our total runtime. <laughs> and we can then dig in and look at the specs. Because I, I think... Uh, this is obviously in my house it's showing that we're on Vodafone here. Um, it's done a test of a read speed and the write speed and the Mac minis are really fast, even with, with Linux on them. Um, we've got the RAM that I set, like you can have seven um, gigs of RAM per job because it's got 16 gigs in it uh, and a bit more information there. Where this can be really helpful is if you've got something like a, a matrix. So I think you, one of you work at, um, with OpenShift quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. So probably one of the things that you do or someone in your team does is kind of make sure nothing's broken each time there's a new release. Um, GitHub Actions is great at um, matrixes. So in this instance, we can just put in all of the builds we want. And when we commit this, it will install K3S with a tool I wrote called Ketchup. Um, and then it will apply a custom resource just to see if that resource is compatible with that Kubernetes mm -hmm. version. Now, what I'll do at the same time is get us up on the control plane instead. And we can see the previous job that got scored and allocated to a host. This is a little bit like what Kubernetes does when you schedule a new pod. And we'll hit commit. And you will see 
about seven events coming from webhooks from GitHub. They're all getting scored scored by the scheduler for the machines we've got. We've got this dispatch showing what machine it's actually been sent out to. And in one instance, we see that it's actually gone to this machine, which is different from the M1. Mm. That is one that I'm renting from Equinix Metal. It's a big ampere machine that has uh, 80 cores and 256 gigs of RAM. So it's a bit of a monster. Hopefully not paying too much in rent. <laughs> Get that. I'm getting that complimentary. Uh, nice. But if you do want to buy it, it's 250 an hour. AWS oh. have uh, an R machine that's 350 a month. Um, it's a bit cheaper with less cores. But this isn't really about ARM. I'm, I'm just using it as the demo. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we'll see is all of our builds starting. One is even finished. Wow. And if we have one customer with us now that's running live, and they have um, 10 build slots is what they're paying for. So if they schedule 20 jobs, we'll start the 10, hold the other 10 back, and then schedule them when there's capacity, just like Kubernetes does. Mm -hmm. Um, now this is a solution that's, you know, relatively new, but because it's all built with cloud native technology, we're able to do some quite interesting stuff. So, um, we can see the rate that jobs have been queued versus the rate that the VMs have been launched. So you can see we launched quite a lot at once. Um, whether there's any delays, like, because this is on, uh, I think on mine, I've got two machines running so uh the capacity is just slightly restricted and then we have some agent based metrics like ram io how many vms are running and etc this is have you updated that grafana ui just <laughs> i'm just kidding updated it yeah <laughs> we'll have to do that's the hosted one so they should be doing it for us nice. but oh. in 30 seconds per job all run in parallel so the total runtime was only one minute. Um, imagine if you had to test like 10 Kubernetes versions and each one of those was going to take an hour. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that will make that a lot faster. Um, so Firecracker has been around for at least a, a good couple of years now. It's hit 1.0. Um, the kind of use cases that it's really well suited to are where you've got to virtualize some some kind of code for a batch job like we're doing here or run some untrusted code or you need some kind of isolation. And so that's why you are probably not using it in the OpenShift platform because Docker is doing or Podman's doing a decent enough job for the kind of stuff that you do. Mm -hmm. But when you need that level of isolation because you're running a SaaS like AWS Lambda is a gigantic SaaS, um, you need to be able to make sure that workloads don't break out. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Steve, you, uh, you've been awfully quiet. That's any... you keep talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? I, I mean, I'm just going to dive into this and probably play around with this all weekend. This is very cool. Yeah. What you are... definitely have a look at it. Um, this is, this is uh, in pilot at the moment. So mm -hmm. open FAS is one of the main things that you've, that you probably, people have known me for. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. within our pretty small company, um, we, we create open FAS, we create a network tunnel solution called Inlets. Um, and Actuate is actually one of the first products we've created that's a service. So it's a SaaS mm -hmm. and it is not open source. Um, mm. This is like six to 10 months of R and D uh and wages and one thing and another so the way we're we're giving this to the community is if you want access to it you pay for a subscription uh if it's not working for you anymore you can just go back to hosted runners mm -hmm. um or you know the the other solutions like running your runners on a kubernetes cluster but knowing that you're doing that in an insecure way uh and trying to mitigate it Awesome. So if somebody wants to get started and uh, subscribe, is there any couple of use cases? Like, yes, yeah, so that's the best you, way to get started. If you were over actuated, F, it brings you over to the docs, which explains the problem that we're trying to solve for. Um, and it might be that you, you look at this and you think, these aren't problems I have, in which case we might not be for you. But I think for a lot of teams, if you either build a container 
uh, or run one in CI and you're using a solution on Kubernetes, you probably take a look at this. If you need to do CI faster for public repos, there isn't another solution at the moment that is suitable from a security standpoint. Um, and if you just use GitHub Actions and you want to try some of the things I showed you, like a matrix build or run kind, compile a kernel, all of these examples will work with the hosted runners if you just put in their Ubuntu latest instead of actuated. Wow. Seems pretty cool. I can see a lot of... Uh... I will be bringing this to our build team. I mean, we're almost everything we do at Bridge Crew is serverless, like everything. Yeah. And we are, we are, we are maybe running self-hosted runners on the public repo. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we're under Keep attack between, earlier this year. Keep it between <laughs> us and our friends. Yeah. 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 Um, so th this is a hybrid model because I, you know, everything that I've done from. Uh, or started from open FAS through to inlets, through to, to catch up on arcade. They're all designed to be able to run on any cloud, on any software, um, and have that self hosted feel because that's how you get the ultimate control and autonomy over your platform. You're not sort of locked into a, a SaaS product and, and sort of um, you know, beholden to them. With this example, it's sort of a hybrid. You bring your own machines because this is your proprietary IP, these are, this is your code that you're going to be running, but we schedule the jobs, we build all of the code to isolate the VMs uh, and talk to GitHub for you, and we're also getting different sort of insights that we're starting to look into now, who's been causing the most build minutes, uh, what builds run the longest, is there an increase versus last week, and as I say, this won't be a fit for everybody, so we've also sort of compared hosted runners versus if you just installed the runner on a, a normal machine with no isolation versus a Kubernetes solution. So you can go have a look at that, see if it's for you. Yeah, that's a great breakdown. That is really good. What's the link? Where are you looking right now? I, I, the word live is obscuring where you're. Oh, OK. Um, this is actuated.dev. Actuated.dev. OK, cool. Yeah. yeah the, the... Looks like a MK doc site. I'm not this is an MK docs, yeah. Yeah. Um, the way that I'm building this is an entrepreneur built a company, started in 2019. It is bootstrapped. Is following um, the principles of the, there's a book called uh, the Right It, which involves doing very small pre prototypes to see if there's interest in a product or potential market fit, and then only building small increments, testing it, piloting it. This is fully working software with a couple of live customers in production, including us, but we haven't built a website for it yet. Mm -hmm. ah. Until we get more customers, we validate that this is something that people want to pay for. It's a problem they care about solving. Um, unlike with open source where, you know, you can work on it as much as you want, even if there's no fit or no one's ever going to pay you for it. Yeah. Um, you work, spend as much time as you want on it <laughs> with this. We're trying to see, is there an opportunity here? Uh, we think there's a problem that needs to be solved. But at the end of the day, the market is the really going to vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's awesome. I have i can't count the number of times people and working at Red Hat with pipelines and builds and stuff like that. Just things aren't optimized. They're sometimes a little slower. Sometimes it's the platform. Sometimes it's the way people are building their applications. But um, I mean just it, you're saving a ton of money especially if you can just cut down the the build time by half i mean sim simple things like patching or you know you have a cve you need to update and yeah. do all your all your tests internally i mean that's a massive time saver right so there's a i see a yeah. ton of value there there are other things you can do as well you can use github's caching but you know all of these things add additional complexity and every time you want to change it it slows you down mm -hmm. um this can as it said make your CI blazingly fast uh, for end-to-end -end tests. We can par If you can paralyze it, so you're running, I don't know, like five parts of your pipeline at once instead of waiting and blocking and just being really serial, mm -hmm. then putting that on fast compute, you can blast through that um, in no time. Now, I do want to say thanks for mentioning Arcade. If anybody wants to know about the, the other open source stuff I do, go to 
github.com Alex Ellis. See a couple of my ebooks on here. And then I've pinned uh, what I think are like the most interesting projects I'm working on at the moment. And people can just go have a look at them. They were all meant to be as easy as possible to get started with, um, have a very similar user experience, lots of community around them too. Yeah, fair enough. And you have your own website, I think, alexellis.io as well. Yeah. Um, although really, probably to get a profile is is where you'll be able to get anything you want anyway. <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, that's... Uh... There's that. And also K3s in under 60 seconds. I think that's an awesome uh, yeah. use case for people looking to get started as well. Very yeah. Cool. One of the, well, the build that I showed with the matrix, if I still have the tab open, this is using Ketchup mm. to install K3S, which is a fully fledged Kubernetes version. And it's part of the CNCF. Um, and it formulates the installation command. It then gets the cube config and makes it pretty and usable. Whereas if you're to try and create a three node HA cluster with the K3S command itself, there's a lot of orchestration behind that. So mm -hmm. Ketchup just makes it super simple. And um, there's large companies using it like Gitpod and there's a team at Azure that got in contact with me recently as well. Plus loads of people with their Raspberry Pis like me. And Steve. And me. Yeah, yeah. I, I use all your stuff to, to load well, my that's really files. cool. I'm going to go meta there and swap my screen because <laughs> so I don't have two screens. Yeah, the uh, the infinity window. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Uh, thanks again for coming on, especially on a, on a Friday. I know you. No problem. Hopefully yeah, you have some big things planned up. Are you uh, going to reinvent by any chance? Won't be reinvent this year. I haven't actually been to one of those yet, but who knows? With all this firecracker stuff we're doing, might have to go one day. Yeah, or uh, Cloud Native Security Con in February, I think would be pretty awesome I'll, yeah I know i'll be there so who's hopefully. running that uh that's the cncf they split off the co-located day oh cool yeah so they yeah. have their the own event and uh yeah it's, it's very interesting watching those co-located days be turned into their own events i'm wondering how many cncf events are going to be yeah future, and it's, it's separate separate month as well yes yeah so instead of like the two-day security event uh, before kubecon they're just doing it in february it's a one security day. I think the security team got a little overwhelmed with doing two events, like you know, one in Europe, one in North America, for two days. So I don't, yeah. I don't really understand it yet. Yeah, because is there is there now no EU and NA security con, or it's just one? Yeah. So uh, originally, I reached out to uh, Chris and Zazek, and he said mm -hmm. that there probably will. And then I guess somebody else internally at Red Hat reached out and said, no, there's no security day as a co-located event anymore. It's just the event that's separate now. Wild. Okay. Yeah. And so. is there one and there's just one of them now. Just one. And there's always going to be in the America. security track in, at KubeCon. So that at each KubeCon there's the security track. Yeah. But then if you want to go to just the security day for I mean, like don't get me started on. about that. It's so hard even for someone like me to get a paper accepted at KubeCon. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had yeah. one accepted for a really long time in it. Um I've got to the point where I think they're trying to tell me something. <laughs> well they're telling us too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, right. Steve, you want to take it away? No, I think that's, I think we can, unless there's anything else, Alex, do you want to, shall we wrap it up? Can we let you go? Um, Firecracker is a really cool tool. Just to sum up, uh, we found a business use case for it, but um, other companies are finding their own use case as well, whether it's to like load a, a notebook for a customer or an IDE. Um, it's not going to replace containers, but you can use it with similar tools to what you use with containers. And it might be worth having a look into if you've got that kind of use case where you want that extra isolation, security, um, or just something that's really ephemeral. You might not yeah. even want to get into Kubernetes. You've got a legacy platform and you need some execution environment. It could be a really good fit. Mm -hmm. Go try it out. Yeah, I mean, we talk about uh, everybody using Jenkins for a lot of their build stuff. So it's uh, there's definitely yeah. a, a big use case there. Um, very cool. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Cool. Thanks for having us. All right. All right. All right. We'll wrap it up. Steve is going to be at, uh, at uh, the Amazon event next week. So may or may reinvent. not be live. Yeah. Reinvent. We may or may not be live. Uh, I'm not going to be live end. next week. I just looked at it and realized I have 15 hours of flying next uh, Friday. So I will there not you go. be available. So we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, I'll have a nice demo for you. Um, enjoy your Thanksgiving for the American watchers. Uh, until then, I'm Mike Foster. Steve Jagger. Take care. Up.